Welcome to Career Conversations, a podcast of the IEEE's Eta Kapannu. I am your host Vikrant Shah. I am a member of the IEEE HKN Young Alumni Team. We are a group of young engineers and computer scientists navigating our own careers and sharing conversations about work, life, family and everything in between. A big welcome to today's guest, Bala Prasanna. Bala is a computer scientist with graduate degrees from India and Southern Illinois University. His illustrious career in includes stints as an assistant professor at SUNY State University of New York, a 20 plus year career at AT&T and 10 plus years at IBM in various technical and management roles. Bala has been an active IEEE volunteer for the last 25 years, serving in various roles including as a national speaker on professional development and career management topics. He was also the treasurer of the IEEE Northeast region for over 10 years and most recently Bala has been elected as the Northeast Region Director-Elect. Today, we are going to be talking about conflicts in the workplace, dealing with difficult people. Disagreements and healthy debates are essential parts of a workplace to further innovation and proliferation of good ideas. But when do these cross the line and become conflicts? If you haven't had to deal with one yet, it's only a matter of time. Bala has some experience in the area of conflict management in the workplace. Today, we will chat with him about the different aspects of conflicts in the workplace and learn a few tips and tricks that we can all use. Bala, I'm very happy to have you here today. To put things in context, our audience is mainly people in their early careers, approximately up to 10 years into their careers. So to start off, what made you start thinking about conflict management as an issue that you care about? Thank you, Vikrant, for an opportunity to share with your listeners a few things in the all too important area of conflict management. I started out as a young career professional like everybody and grew to be a mentor, supervisor, manager, you know. I spent several years as a lead in a critical systems incident management team where I had to work with dozens of people with varying degrees of interest and stake. At the end of the day, as employees, we all have the same objective, which is successful completion of whatever we have been tasked with and align with the greater objective of the team or department or company that we are all a part of. This requires a convergence of ideas and implementations. What I saw, what I perceived and learned over the years during my career helped me come up with an attitude and approach that worked for me and I'm eager to share that with you and your listeners. I'm really looking forward to this discussion and towards the end I would really like your take on some of the situation that me and other HKN team members have faced. Um, so let's get started. We are all engineers here so let's start with some definitions and assumptions. What do you think of when we talk about workplace conflicts? Generally, a conflict has a negative connotation. It makes a person nervous or edgy. It is a state of mind. It is largely defined by one's own personality. Once you feel you are in a conflict with this connotation, you are in danger of being in a download spiral. Why is it important to know how to deal with workplace conflicts? How would you respond to someone who says, I'm a nice person and I get along with everyone. Why do I care about this? Being nice and getting along with everyone certainly sounds good. But I must caution you that it runs the risk of underselling yourself and to exaggerate to make a point, you may be perceived as a doormat and taken advantage of by your colleagues. That leads to resentment at being ineffective and being non-contributory. You need to have what it takes to be able to bend the reality of your counterpart to line up with yours when necessary and when your gut tells you so. Thus, it is important for you to introspect and analyze yourself. If you are being nice because you are afraid of creating or dealing with conflicts, Remember, conflict is common and unavoidable in a workplace setting. There is no need to be jittery or nervous. Resolving conflicts in a productive way is very important 
being able to handle conflicts in a workplace setting is important for career growth and personal management. I am definitely sold. You have convinced me. The next thing I have been wondering about is what turns a discussion, debate or even a disagreement into a conflict. What are your thoughts about that? We all run the risk of making disagreements into conflicts by making things overly personal or seeing things through an emotional lens rather than a logical lens. These are common thinking traps that we can avoid with practice and mindful interactions with other people. So what is your advice to someone who is either a party to a conflict or about to be a party to a conflict? How can they prevent it from escalating? To prevent a conflict from escalating, it is helpful to be mindful of what your personal antennas are telling to scope out a developing conflict. Timing is important. Sooner is better than later. Collect your marbles, line up your alliances, have a good understanding of other points of view, think of face-saving remedies, and shortly after that, sit down for a face-to-face -face interaction with your counterparts. Don't let a difference of opinion harden into resentment or anger. Subala, so let's say someone didn't have a chance to listen to this podcast yet and they missed step one and step two. Um, they are now in a full-blown conflict that is affecting productivity. It is at a point where two people cannot be in the same room without pulling each other's hair. What would your advice be for dealing with situations like that? Take some time out for some introspection and to think logically. Is there some value or truth to the other person's opinion or position? Remember, there's more than one way to bake a cake. Be mindful if it is a battle or a war that you must have your way. As our parents and grandparents may have taught us, sometimes when you win an argument, you still lose. Conversely, sometimes when you lose, you win. Make a case in a non-personalized way to some of your angels. It's very important to have angels who can be supportive of you and are on your side. Solve the problem without personalizing. Think of face-saving options. Don't drive yourself or your co-worker into a corner. Always have a way out. Train yourself to agree to disagree agreeably. Try as much as possible without needing to escalate. Escalation is always last resort. As uh, renowned physicist Richard Feynman reminds us, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. That is one of my favorite quotes and it is definitely very apt here. So moving on, let's say you're lucky enough that you're not part of a conflict but are observing one. How can someone help or intervene in a situation like that? That is a good question, Vikrant. If uh, I'm not a party to a conflict, but I'm a member of the team, then I have to have a grasp of what I'm empowered to do in that setting. Am I a manager? Am I a colleague, a moderator, a coordinator? While this gives me varying degrees of empowerment, I would be sure to step up to what I'm empowered with and then start out by taking a timeout or a reset as dictated by the situation. I would uh, try to understand what is said, get clarity and opinions. I would also establish disagreement between the ideas without personalizing. I would also factor in time and cost implications. Furthermore, I would be ready to shake things up. Like, for example, challenge the participants with how, what, why questions instead of just no, yes responses. With these questions, you are likely to make progress towards a resolution 
in solving the conflict than not. Establish and strive to get to the higher purpose or the objective or the need of that situation. I would always be mindful to be impersonal and balanced in my approach. So if I may summarize, it is better to do something than nothing and it is better to do something sooner than later. True Vikrant, I could not have said it better. So far, we have talked about what conflicts are and how they can get out of hand. Can you please tell us how we can be proactive and avoid conflicts in the first place? Another good question, Vikrant. Great. Right foot forward. What comes to my mind? Having the right mindset. It includes a few things. Most importantly, coming to terms with your own self. What values are important to you? And make sure everything else is aligned to those values. Predicate your work life to stand on pillars that reflect those values. Some of the values that I can enumerate are being professional under all circumstances. Being professional, it's pretty loaded. In this context, in addition to that, include getting over the aversion to handling conflict. The next one is integrity. It's very important you bring integrity to workplace. Preparedness, apart from the usual thorough preparation that may include bouncing your ideas or points with peers and other experts, say in technical matters, pay attention to the emotions insights and instincts needed make this work for you. Again, let me repeat. Pay attention to the emotions, insights and instincts that you need to bring. Make this work for you. The next one is communicate effectively, listen genuinely. In this context, engage in conflict resolution without inflicting damage. The next one is head-heart balance. Being logical and coherent is the head part of it. Setting the right tone with choice of helpful words is the heart part of it. You need to find the right balance. The next one and the last one is being resilient. Use your prerogative to claim what is your right. As already noted, use how, what, why instead of no, yes responses. You will be surprised with the results you'll be able to get with these additional questions. Bala, that was all about looking within. Is there something similar we can do with our surrounding environment? If you make relationship management an integral part of your personal management, you are sure to realize untold and unimagined benefits. Relationship management may be of two types in our context. One is manage your boss. The second one is managing your peers or co-workers. Manage your boss. What do you mean manage your boss? The boss is supposed to manage us, right? That's the traditional conventional thinking. But in this case, it is deliberate. In managing your boss, the first thing is to understand boss's expectations. The next thing is align and commit to produce output accordingly. In real life, it is easier said than done, but it's very important. The next thing is the bosses always love to get information. They love to be communicated, right? So how do they prefer to be communicated? Email, SMS, in-person over coffee, so many different ways. So find out what works with the boss that you have at the moment and go with the flow accordingly. The next one is realize your manager has other peer managers and he also has a supervisory manager. So these people around him or her have their own expectations on your manager. 
So seek to find out what those expectations are when possible and make your manager successful by producing or aligning or meeting those expectations that are laid out for your manager. The next one is managing your peers or co-workers. This can be pretty tricky because your peers are also your competitors in many situations. But realize they are your angels too. Their opinion of you matters in proportions, in getting nice assignments, etc. Remember, they can also help cover when you make mistakes. So that is why this relationship management is very important. And if it is a part of your personal management lifestyle, you will be very well served. Another thing I often think about is that we get into disagreements with friends and family all the time, but we rarely think of that as conflict. What makes the workplace different? Anger. Anger is what most people experience when they encounter disagreements in workplace. It is normal and it happens. But you need to train yourself to refrain or restrain from certain acts or activities. For example, sending out an email that you may regret later. Be always sure that when you do send out, that the tone and the content can stand the test of time. Uncontrolled hallway comments, criticizing the manager or the management, your peers, etc. If these things get out, in a workplace setting, they are irreversible and may extract a heavy price. In a family or a friendly setting, you can say certain things and you can get away because people will forgive you for those things. But in a workplace setting, that is very unlikely to happen. So it's very important how you manage your anger. So it is okay to be angry, but how you manage your anger becomes very important. Oh, that reminds me. Do you have any advice on how we can handle criticism better? How do you handle criticism? Hmm. The first thing is not to get angry. The next one is how to recognize good criticism. When people criticize us, our egos are hurt and we feel bad. But there is a possibility that these people who criticize us are holding a mirror to see our own blind sides. I am often reminded of Dr. House or Simon Cowell, uh, famous TV characters from yesterday years. If you are lucky to have people of that stature give their criticism, they are saying things that you might not have understood about yourself. And if you do heed to those criticisms or input, you will be well served. Of course, you know, we have in our workplace, people want to have fun, they criticize at our expense, and that is the kind of criticism that you want to ignore. Ignore such jokers. You know, just putting these things together, I can summarize in the following way. Take yourself further. So it's an incremental process. So continue to keep building on your own skill set, on your own personal management system, and so on. So understanding and constantly improving your personal management system, this would put you ahead of the game. You will be well served. Think of playing a tennis game with you equipped with a high-tech contemporary racket, shoes, skill set, and you know topspin, backspin, backhand, and all sorts of these contemporary skills, aided by a great coach, and so on. You get the idea. And on the other side, you have a good player. He's dressed well in decades-old period dress. 
and shoes and playing with a wooden racket. What do you think your chances are? That's a great example. I would definitely rather be the former player. What else can you say about conflicts that we have not talked about? In the complex world we live, different people have different personalities. And hence, they deal with a given conflict situation differently. We can broadly say there are about five different personality types. The first one is dominating or competing personality type, where you assert your position and then you offer either a little or no leeway for uh, opposing viewpoints. The second personality type is avoiding, where you don't like the situation, therefore you stall, you ignore and hope it goes away, or uh, just don't do anything about it, be blind to the whole thing. The third type is collaborating, here relationship is important, so you try to satisfy both sides, so you work the issue. Accommodating type is uh, you are selfless in this case, so you forego your concerns because you want to make the other person happy, therefore you let the other person have their way all the time. Compromising type. So if you have that personality, you tend to you know, engage in negotiations, find middle ground, and then uh, that is how you get things done. The point here is, whatever your personality type is, do not overuse that type. Be flexible. Be able to play the other personality types. For example, if I, let us say, I have a dominating personality. I have loud voice. I have the ear of the manager and other influential people in the group. So then, if I go with that personality type to all these meetings, then what happens is, all too often, our colleagues would yield to me because I'm dominating, I have a loud voice, and uh, I have the ear of the manager, and so on and so forth. So, even when my ideas are not the best, people will yield to me. So, over a period of time, what happens is, then even if my ideas are not good, then that's what gets played. And that's not necessarily a good thing, either for myself or the team or the uh, department that we are all a part of. Therefore, I need to have a different personality that I need to invoke. I need to be able to encourage others to speak and seek out other opinions by having me shut up. Okay. Another flip example is if I am uh, accommodating type, so then, if I am always foregoing my concerns and yielding to others, then I effectively become a doormat because people will walk over me because I don't have an opinion, I don't have a say in the game. So I become basically a doormat. So that's not a very good thing either. So at that point, you need to be able to change your personality, become one of the other ones, like, you know, the dominating type or uh, collaborating or something. So uh, it is okay to say, you know, to pound on the table sometimes and say, hey, this is my idea. It may not be the best, but it deserves to be heard because I have worked very hard at it. I have done my research and so on. So you need to be able to uh, invoke a different personality than your dominant personality. So that's the message here. I guess too much of anything is not good, including one's personality. Bala, thanks for a great discussion. Next, um, I have qu real life examples that I solicited from other young alumni members and I would like to get your take on those. The first one is a personal example. I had a disagreement with one of our contractors who was a very type A personality. He was a lot more experienced and we were at a vendor's office reviewing something that the vendors were designing for us. I spotted something that would have been technically unsafe in the design and suggested removing like something simple like a check valve. This person did not understand the technical aspect of why it was a problem and was adamant about his opinion and refused to budge. 
The vendors eventually understood my point of view, but didn't say anything to upset the contractor. In my case, I had to discuss this with my technical team lead, who was the contractor's hunting buddy, and that got him to back off. So my, my question to you is, what is your advice about dealing with strong type A personalities? That sure must have been an unpleasant and an unwelcome situation for you. Uh, going forward, it's always important not to air dirty laundry, if I may say so, in front of the customer. It's always important to present a unison of ideas or solutions in front of the customer. So be cognizant of what you discuss in front of third party. In your particular situation, as an employee, I believe I would have more responsibility than the contractor and therefore I exercise that responsibility to take the lead. I would perhaps say something like, you know, let's leave it here and pick it up at the next meeting and we'll have a solution by the next meeting. And that could be a face saving way for all. Later on, if you are able to work with the contractor, who is the type A personality, if he is willing to listen to you, so you would uh, uh, challenge his assertions with your uh, logical reasoning and your uh, sample data and so on and so forth. And if that does not work, certainly you know, like you did, you would take it up with the next step. You escalate it, you take it with the team lead or the manager. And all along, you always have to keep the idea as central and not these uh, uh, opinions that uh, seem to be taking you off the course. Now, going to type A personalities, it's very important. We will have those kind of people in our workplace environment. So instead of submitting, you need to find a situation where you are going to confront or have to work with a type A personality person. So prepare extra beforehand. Have all responses ready. Build support with peers. Present evidence. When all these things are done, when you do meet with the person, be able to pound on the table and size them up. Don't be a doormat. You may not have to pound on the table Raise your voice too often when dealing with type A people, but accept the fact that you will have to do it at least once or sometimes. This will be good for your self-respect and self-confidence and also <clears throat> it will be a notice to the A personality uh, peer. The next question is from one of our team members. I realized that my supervisor was inviting the men in our group to interview candidates for positions. The women in our group were asked to take candidates to lunch. This felt very unfair to me since taking a candidate to lunch doesn't give you practice interviewing or allow you to give input on their candidacy. I confronted my boss about this to share feedback. I would have played just a little bit differently Vikrant. Instead of confronting my boss, I would say something like, Boss, have you noticed this, that you have been making the interview part of uh, the assignment uh, given to only the men here and the women are just taking care of uh, the less juicy part of the process, which is taking them to lunch and so on. You know, we are equally productive. We can do some of the same things, you know, that the men are doing such as in this case interviewing the candidates because we took the same training course along with those people so next time when it happens why don't you try us out why don't you try the women folk out so give it the benefit of doubt the idea here is it will be first off hopefully a face saving uh, situation for the manager and second of all you are trying to find a way that is likely to succeed rather than confrontational that makes you know, matters have a tendency to make the matters worse. This is great advice. I think when someone is in the middle of a conflict, letting the other person win is the last thing that comes to mind. So giving a face saving option is a great way to de-escalate. The next question is, 
I was chairing a committee for a volunteer project. A co-worker asked to join and I had to turn him down since the committee was full. They were very hurt and started avoiding me at work. What are your thoughts? Asked to fill the committee with uh, members, you did what you had to do, which is taking into consideration several aspects, such as perhaps group dynamics, a team that can provide or produce the best output, perhaps stacking the committee horizontally for a broader perspective, and so on. And now, of course, you know, somebody is offended because that person is not made a part of the team. So what do you do? Speak with this person and try to understand what is the issue. Prepare your response in a way that reflects your professionalism, your authority, the expectation interested to you, and make sure words come out the right way. Minimize having to shoot from the hip. That's all the questions I had. In summary, this discussion has changed my perspective on thinking about workplace conflicts. The big message for me is that depending on one's personality, state of mind, and history, the same incident can be perceived as a conflict or a debate. Another thing is that instead of being reactive, it is much better to be proactive about conflicts. It is good for your own peace of mind and it is good for your organization. So Bala, the last thing I would like to ask you is what are three things that our listeners can immediately do today to start making a positive change? First of all, take stock of what values are important to you. Understand and practice the behaviors necessary to get there relentlessly. The second one is watch how your managers or executives or senior peers conduct themselves and what makes them successful. What is their choice of words or how do they articulate, how do they set tone? All these are important lessons to learn from. Finally, continuous improvement of emotions, insights and instincts that have guided you in each of your encounters. So make sure you get better and better at it with every instance. That will, in addition to your technical prowess, these things will add an additional weight to make you more successful. Thank you, Bala, for talking to us and for your words of wisdom. I have definitely learned a lot today. It was great having you. Thank you once again. Thank you, Vikrant, for the great questions and an opportunity to speak to your listeners about one of the most important topics that can make or break one's career in your Career Conversations series. I wish your audience great success as they equip themselves with skills necessary to survive and thrive in today's workplace. Thank you. Another big thank you to our audience for joining us on this episode of HK and Career Conversations. Please remember to subscribe to this podcast, visit our YouTube channel, and find us at hkn.org.